The perfect German soldier is one that never has to eat, never has to sleep, and always makes the right decisions. In their search for a super soldier, the Nazis stumbled into a world of psychoactive substances and amphetamines, which ultimately led to their downfall. <laughs> Hitler and his government opposed any drugs that would alter the mind, claiming it impure to poison the body. They were so devout in their mission to clear society of its drug addictions, they set up a tattletale system in which German citizens could convey observations about drug-addicted acquaintances and family members so that corrective action can be taken immediately. German propaganda at the time directly equated Jews to bacilli or pathogens. Even children's books carried a similar message. In The Poisonous Mushroom, Jews and drugs were combined into a single metaphor to teach children that Jews, like drugs, must be eradicated. This stemmed from the anti-Semitic view that Jews themselves were a poisonous society. In 1938, a Berlin-based pharmaceutical company called Temmler created a medicine in hopes of taming drug abuse that could relieve drug users of the symptoms they experienced from withdrawal of cocaine, alcohol, and even opiates. The drug, called Pervitin, was methamphetamine in tablet form and was available without prescription in Germany. It would increase alertness and productivity and curb appetite. The German army recognized that while their greatest foe was the Allied forces, their biggest battle would be against fatigue and sleep. Military doctor Otto Friedrich Rank took notice of the drug's popularity in both the public and its unofficial use in the military. Some missions demanded the soldiers stay awake for three days and three nights at a time. It was decided that overcoming sleep was more important than the concern for any related health risks. In Ronk's own words, relaxing on the day of fighting can decide the battle. Hitler had been experiencing abdominal and digestive issues. Per his personal physician, Theo Morell, he began taking hormone injections and custom multivitamins to ease his pain. To keep the Führer alert and fresh for his daily meetings, Morell started sneaking more and more insidious substances into Hitler's daily hormone injections, over time growing the concoction to over 80 different substances. An important meeting with Mussolini was scheduled for 1943 to discuss Italy switching sides in the war. The night before, Hitler's stomach pains and anxiety reached a new level, and Morell's normal injections weren't doing the trick. Morell had a medication he knew might work to quell Hitler's violent spastic constipation and pain. The drug was called Eucadol, an opioid painkiller made from oxycodone. Morell knew Hitler's chances of becoming addicted and dependent on the drug were high, but decided to take the risk and save the next day's meeting, administering another dose right before it started. Hitler was apparently in such good spirits and giddy with enthusiasm that Mussolini barely got a word in and wasn't able to withdraw Italy's support for Germany. On July 20th, 1944, a group of German conspirators unsuccessfully attempted to assassinate Hitler and prominent SS officers with a briefcase bomb. The explosion from this failed coup left Hitler almost deaf, and as the Eucadol wore off, his whole body ached. Because his eardrums were ruptured, an ear, nose, and throat specialist was called. At the time, cocaine was the best local anesthesia available, so nose and throat dabs of the drug were administered. Hitler was now addicted to Pervidin, Eucadol, and cocaine, among the slush of other concoctions Morell was injecting. Medical historians have now diagnosed Hitler as suffering from Parkinson's disease. All the drugs couldn't have helped. The 150 tablets and 8 to 10 injections every week quickly deteriorated his body. Hitler had to put his hands on his legs to make the shaking less visible when he was sitting down. In late 1944, the British bombing campaigns aimed at Germany's manufacturing sector destroyed much of Merck's facilities, greatly limiting the supply of Eucadol. Hitler was now in full withdrawal. Now his tooth enamel was decaying, his gums were drying up, and his ruinous teeth were falling out. His brain, irreversibly damaged by neurotoxins, was no longer receiving stimulation. He started digging into his yellow skin with a pair of golden tweezers with aggressive nervous movements to get rid of the bacteria. He was full on losing it. In early 1945, he saw his impending doom. He had now become what he despised, a man controlled by the substances he once condemned. This video was based off this book I just read called Blitzed by Norman Aller. I'm on this World War II kick right now and there's just so much interesting stuff out there to learn. And I thought this was an interesting topic to really look at Hitler's life and who he was as a person and what motivated him to make the decisions he made later in his life. 
I mentioned before in the video that Hitler's personal doctor, Theo Morel, was injecting him with up to 80 different substances. So here's me trying to read and pronounce all these substances in German. Acetyl pepsin, antiphlogistine, argentin nitrisum, belladonna obstinol, benerva forte, betabion, bismogenol, brom nervicin, bravolatan 5, capsin, calcium sandinol, calcium sandinol,